Good morning, everyone. I will be introducing the chair for today's seminar, Dr. Matthias Cornelikus. He's a Dutch physici physician who settled in India in 1976. He has co-founded Mirambika, a research center for integral education in New Delhi. He's also founded Sri Aurobindo Center for Consciousness at Indian Psychology Institute in Pondicherry. He's deeply interested in finding the knowledge and know-how developed in the spiritual tradition and inculcate that in academic psychology. Continuing with his interest area, he has organized several conferences and seminars and workshops and edited various books and articles based on yoga research methodologies and Indian psychology, as well as consciousness studies. Presently, he teaches integral psychology at Sri Aurobindo Center of Education in Pondicherry and maintains two websites in this area. With this, I hand over the program to Sir. Welcome, Sir. Thank you, Poonam. Uh, am I audible? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yes, Sir, you're audible. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, it is a very great joy to uh, chair a session with uh, Vladimir. So thanks to Jotna for organizing this meeting and for Nimhans to organizing the uh, whole conference. Um, I actually would like to, uh, to leave the word very fast to Vladimir because he has a lot to contribute. Um, although coming from somewhere very different from India, he uh, thinks in Sanskrit and uh, is very much, uh, the Gita, I think, is very much part of his, his being. So I would like to ask Vladimir to start with a little introduction on how he got interested in the Gita. And uh, so I hope he doesn't mind yeah, thank you. telling thank something you. personal. <laughs> right. Thank you, Matthias, for this kind of uh, invitation to go into the memories and the beginnings, how it happened. Yes, it was, it was kind of, um, um, my story is quite unusual because I was born in, in Soviet Union. My father and mother were communists, bureaucrats. My father was the propagandist of atheism, actually. He was going around telling that there is no God. And um, so, uh, and then uh, suddenly his son became somebody who was looking for something higher. It was a kind of a crisis in my life uh, when I came from the army that uh, I just didn't find any meaning in life. And then I was looking for some answers. And then I discovered uh, Indian uh, yoga. And that was first Krishna Murti, and then there were others, mystics uh, from the East, from the West. Uh, there were studies of Christian mystics, and um, and uh, finally I discovered uh, uh, the Gita and the Veda. And there were only a few books um, published in the Soviet Union at that time, and we were hunting these books. They were so rare. There were only 5,000 uh, copies made from Gita, only 5,000 copies. And translation was made somewhere in uh, Ashgabat. Uh, someone, someone said that they're they not able to hear. Yeah, it's uh, a problem with the sound. I can hear uh, perfectly. We can fine. hear. Maybe I should speak louder. Usually people say speak louder. Some people. Oh, so others are saying they are he able to hear. So, madam, uh, you can check at your end. We can, they can hear. Yes. Please go ahead. Yes. And so uh, we were looking for these copies and my friend was even traveling to Ashgabat, bought a ticket uh, to just to buy the copy of the Gita. <laughs> and it was just a translation, yeah? a translation into Russian. There was uh, Smirnov, the, his name was Smirnov. He translated all Mahabharata and published it in Turkmenistan in Ashgabat because neither Moscow nor St. Petersburg were allowing these translations. It was kind of a gray zone. It was not totally allowed, only as literature. And when I was studying in St. Petersburg University, that time it was Leningrad University, I remember that we were not allowed to, uh, to access, uh, for example, Sri Aurobindo. 
and there was the whole uh, 30 volumes um, uh, in, uh, in one library in St. Petersburg and with special permission from KGB. <laughs> I remember we were allowed to go there and to, uh, to see those books. Um, only mm, because I was philologist, I was studying Sanskrit, and that's why I was allowed. But philosophers and psychologists, they had no permission to read these books. <laughs> it's quite interesting. So I remember I asked first time to bring me uh, the 10th volume of Sri Aurobindo's, and it was that older edition of 72, you know, of centenary edition. Uh, and... Um, I received this, uh, the, uh, the secret of the Veda. I, can, I remember that opening that book and sitting. I couldn't even read. I had to just touch the pages and they were golden pages. You know, we remember the edition. And to smell that, that uh, the book, which was there, always there somewhere in the storeroom, a uh, little fungus smelling, but... Uh, that was the, the heaven. I couldn't even read. I had to sit and to meditate with the book, like, like with the being, you know, for one hour sitting, not reading. Even. And then next day I came and I could read. And so, so that I was allowed it because I was phil a philologist. So for the philologists, it was like KGB was quite stupid. They didn't know that philologists also could look for the truth, <laughs> not only philosophers and psychologists. So that was the situation in which um, this literature was very uh, rare and very precious for all of us. We had even the whole um, Sami's dot, which was called Publish Yourself. So people were secretly giving books to each other, you know. And I remember first time when I received the essays on the Gita uh, from someone. And I was I put it into the under the, my coat because it was a winter. And I had to travel home. And I remember it was such a long travel with, with trams and then bus and then uh, metro because St. Petersburg is huge and I lived far away. So I remember that, you know, waiting <laughs> impatiently just to open the book. <laughs> so I rushed into my room, opened the book. And I remember in three days, I just gobbled the whole the essays on the Gita. It went in like... So this is something which people take for granted, but if you, uh, uh, if you know what it means to be without this literature and how precious it is, you would uh, have different attitude towards this, these books. Well, it's just a story about Soviet Union uh, memories of that time. And that time, everything looked very, interesting, very promising, uh, very sacred, uh, very intimate. All words had meanings. Uh, you know, we had also a few editions like uh, Integral Vedanta was uh, published by Kostyuchenko, who was, who was criticizing everything, but he was quoting Sri Aurobindo, Gita, and those quotations were very precious. <laughs> so we were reading those books, taking out quotations from them. <laughs> yeah. So that is how slowly I arrived at this. And then I understood that I need Sanskrit. And so I went to the university and miraculously joined the Department of Sanskrit Studies. And then I was sent to India and then my life started. I never left India afterwards. Thanks for sharing. It is uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I prepared something for my topic, which uh, which was announced uh, on on the ego and uh, and the true self and so on and so forth. But I do not know how we should proceed. In what way better to do it? Uh, should I start, or should we have some questions around it, or? Should I make a kind of introduction and then we will kind of continue on that ground? Yeah. 
I think that sounds like a very good proposal. So please do give some of your what you had prepared. Okay. And then we'll see how it comes, whether there are many questions or how we'll take it further. All right. I prepared the whole presentation PowerPoint, which may help just to dwell on certain texts, which are quite difficult to maybe hear immediately directly. So if you don't mind, I will just share them, the PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Do you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Coming fine. So, uh, the whole idea was to uh, to look into these uh, these differences of ego perception and the true self perception and how it is um, dealt with in the Gita and how we are dealing with it in in our everyday psychology, so to say. So ego operates by desires, as we understand, and uh, true self or psychic being within us operates by aspiration. So the, the difference between the two is quite obvious. One leads to kind of destruction of the form, death eventually, and the other leads to, to recreation of life always. Yeah? So uh, the whole uh, problem lies in this particular simple view that uh, our faculties of consciousness, or our consciousness, which operates through faculties, can be turned either outside or inside. So when we turn within, we forget about without. When we turn without, we somehow have a tendency to forget about the within perception. Yeah? So we lose either inner or outer, and we can't easily combine both. By the way, this uh, this was the major problem even uh, addressed in Savitri by Sri Aurobindo, and I'm taking here one quotation from, from Savitri in Satyavan, Canto where Satyavan explains to Savitri when she, he meets her for the first time, that when he looked upon the world, he says, uh, he missed the self. I looked upon the world and missed the self, capital S. And when I found the self, I lost the world. My other selves I lost, and the body of God, the link of the finite and the infinite, the bridge between the appearance and the truth, the mystic aim for which the world was made, the human sense of immortality. This is something... <clears throat> uh, what Sri Aurobindo is uh, interested in to combine both the inner perception, the inner self with the outer living, the human sense of immortality. So this is the basic problem of our psychology. We can be either perceptive, so to say we close our eyes, we you know, we stop thinking, we stop even breathing, and we can dive deeper and deeper into inner perception and find the inner source or inner self within. Or we start acting outside and we lose that inner perception and become kind of unaware of our inner selves. So... It's somehow difficult for us to be both, to be active outside and perceptive <clears throat> within. So the whole method of yoga was developed on this ground that we have to become immobile, that we train our body to be, you know, sitting in the particular posture and a particular asana for many hours. And we train our breathing and we control our breath till it stops breathing or breathes very little. And we notice when we stop breathing, we have a greater control over inner perception. We can dive deeper within. Uh, the moment we start breathing, moving with hands, of walking and so on, we lose the... the uh, the awareness or inner awareness. And it's very difficult to keep both. So this is the problem of our basic psychology. So, and it's quite interesting how Gita... Uh, uh, Vladimir, can I, can I just interrupt for a second? Can you set the uh, uh, PowerPoint on uh, play? 
uh -huh. like this, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I think some people ask that. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, because this it's is too small, yeah. So yeah. Gita addresses this in a particular way. So there is the, in the sixth chapter, uh, we have this interesting two verses, Uddharet Atmanatmanam, Natmanam Avasadayet, Atmaiva Yatmano Bandhur, Atmaiva Ripur Atmanah. So by the self, thou shouldst deliver the self. Thou shouldst not depress and cast down the self. I'm reading from the um, translation supplied in the Sri Aurobindo's book, whether by self-indulgence or suppression, for the self is the friend of the self and the self is the enemy. Now we have two selves. By the self, Atmana, one should raise or one should support or um, put up oneself. And uh, one should not put down oneself by oneself. This is quite an interesting view. So there are two selves, the outer and the inner self. It is by the inner self that the outer self is to be uplifted and supported. And um, because the self is the friend to oneself and the oneself is the enemy to oneself. There is no other enemy and there is no other friend, only me, myself. So, bandhur atma atmanastasya yen atmaiva atmana jitaha anatmanastu shatrutve vartit atmaiva shatruvat. To the man, is his self a friend in whom the lower self has been conquered by the higher self? But to him who is not in possession of his higher self, the lower self is as if an enemy and it acts as an enemy. And it is very true psychologically when we are not in control of ourselves, we really hate ourselves. There's something in us which dislikes that situation that we are not in control of our outer self. So there is this someone else there in control of ourselves. Yes? Some other power, some other being. Yes? So what is obstructing the inner and outer consciousness to be working harmoniously together? So the whole idea that we can turn on either without or within uh, creates this dichotomy, this problem, this opposition within our own psychology. But the solution was proposed by the Upanishads and the Gita is to combine the both. How can we be inner and outer being simultaneously? How can we combine our inner and outer perception together? Is there a technique or special psychology or some kind of uh, technology, psychological, which would allow us to do it? So it's quite interesting how Gita deals with this. Uh, so they describe because the, our inner perception, our indriyas, indriyas represent consciousness basically. And um, our indriyas, when they are turned, when we are, when our purusha, who is the source of these jnanendriyas or indriyas of knowledge or faculties of consciousness, we can call them, when they are turned without and are fixed on the object of sense, there is something happening. And Gita describes this in this way. Sangat sanjayate kamah kamat krodho bhijayate krodhad bhavati sammohak sammohat smriti vibhramaha smriti bhramshat buddhinasho buddhinashat pranashyati. So there is a, the whole description psychological how we lose ourselves in Prakriti, because Prakriti, I'm using now Purusha and Prakriti, terminology of Sankhya. So when Purusha attends to the 
to prakriti, to her actions, to her object of sense. When senses are attending, attaching themselves to the object of sense, slowly we start losing our own self-awareness. So in him whose mind dwells on the objects of sense with absorbing interest, attachment to them is formed. From attachment arises desire. From desire, anger comes forth. Anger leads to the bewilderment. From bewilderment comes loss of memory. And by that, the intelligence is destroyed. We are losing ourselves. In, we, are, we are not remembering ourselves anymore who we are. From the destruction and from destruction of intelligence, he perishes. We lose ourselves. We are no more aware. This is the process by which our Jnanendriyas are lost in the activities connected to the object of sense. And I was, uh, was wondering how all these elements may come together in the meaningful way that we could see what Krishna is offering us in the Gita. So, first of all, uh, what is to be done? Then Jnanendriyas are to be freed. Uh, we, one has to free Jnanendriyas from the object of sense, so to say, uh, which are these object of, objects of sense are cast upon them, of, on Jnanendriyas by Prakriti, and surrender to their master, inner self, Purusha, because all Jnanendriyas are actually coming from Purusha, from our inner being, from the universal Purusha, according to Aitareya, yes? So universal Purusha uh, revealed all these faculties which plunged into the inconscient ocean and from there uh, evolutionary build up the karmendrias, the, the organs of action. So these organs of action become the problem for us. They are the blockage for, for Jnanendriyas. So we have Jnanendriyas on one side and Karmendriyas on another side. That is, these Karmendriyas are hijacking the Jnanendriyas and starting to use them for the Prakriti's sake. And all the energies are put into it. And so, um, so how to separate Jnanendriyas from Karmendriyas, make them free and to find for them their own proper source, their origin, Purusha. So for that, the Jnanendriya should stop, as it were, seeking their own self-satisfaction in the object of sense and become pure channels for the higher light of the Purusha to flow to the surface of our being and become a part of every uh, activity in life. So... And that is the biggest uh, issue for us. That's why we can be either only active or perceptive, because we really didn't build those channels. That light, inner light, is not reaching out to the surface of our being. So renunciation, which was proposed because, because our Jnanendriyas and Karmendriyas are tied together very closely, they are working together. And for us, even it's not imaginable even to, to think of doing something which we don't want anymore. We are so driven by desire that uh, if you ask somebody, why should you do this or that if you don't have the desire, people would never do anything without the desire. <laughs> So the desire itself becomes the motivation of any action. And all the desires are basically uh, coming from prakriti, from the lower, from these karmendriyas involved into the object of sense. So jnanendriyas are looking for their self-satisfaction within the object of sense. You know? And in that sense, they cannot uh, be totally free or easily freed from uh, from the karmendrias. So they have to become disinterested, as it were. They should not run for their self-satisfaction. They should turn within and wait for the deeper light 
of consciousness to to come through them to the surface. They become the channels and they have to be purified to allow that deeper light in us to reach to the surface. I'm speaking a little bit uh, kind of yogic language, but uh, the topic is like this. Gita is about this. So renunciation of all activities which is proposed in life is not a solution according to, uh, to the Gita. Gita is not proposing the ren renunciation of activities and life itself, as it is seen in Advaitic approach, yes? But the renunciation of the desires within Jnanendriyas, within the attachment of Jnanendriyas to the object of sense, because they have to re capture or reconnect to their proper source, to their origin from which they came, from the Purusha within. So changing the motivation from the egocentric and half-conscious Prakriti to the inner, fully conscious Purusha, Uddharet Atman Atmanam, one should raise or support oneself by oneself. And that can result in the union of the two, the outer and the inner being. So that is the basis of karma yoga. So to redirect the jnanendriyas towards the source. And how can we do this? So Krishna proposes this. And here he speaks about, uh, about the ordinary sannyasa and his extraordinary tiyaga. So karmendriya ni samyamya ya astya manasas maran indriyarthan vimur. So the one who controls the organs of action, who doesn't do anything outside, but continues in his mind to remember and dwell upon the objects of sense, such a man has bewildered himself with false notions of self-discipline. Yes. Tu indriyani manasas niyam yara bhati arjuna karmendriye karma yogam asaktah savishishyate. But he who controlling the senses by the mind, O Arjuna, without attachment, engages with the organs of action in yoga of action, he excels. So what he is proposing is not to to renounce the activities in life, but to renounce and control the indriyas, jnanendriyas, not karmendriyas, and uh, control their desires, their search for self-satisfaction. And that would lead us to liberation. And that's why he speaks about um, detachment from the fruit of action. That is the psychological detachment, which frees Jnanendriyas from Karmendriyas and makes uh, uh, the, uh, the possibility for them to find their proper source, their origin from which they come. So here we have this um, the vision of... Um, Purusha Prakriti and the whole Sankhya, which you know very well here, there is five Indriyas or Jnanendriyas and five Karmendriyas. Um, this topic of Karmendriyas is also um, known in the Veda, and they are known as Panis there, and Sri speaks about them as senses of action, Panis, who steal the light of inner perception and hide it in subconscious cave. Because Karmendriyas evolved from the inconscient, from the beginning of our evolution. These are the organs of action for the Jnanendriyas who actually, as consciousness, embodied here and built these organs in evolutionary stage by stage. So they, the Karmendriyas do not know how to give themselves, how to sacrifice. They know only how to, how to uh, grow from the darkness to lesser darkness, as it were. <laughs> how to steal the light. They need the action of uh, Jnanendriyas for their own functionality, uh, because that is the consciousness they use for their own fa uh, function. Um, so, um,
I will skip this slide. And this is the slide I borrowed from uh, Matthias' book, from his article, which is also explaining quite well these, uh, these differences, the surface consciousness and the inner self-knowledge, Purusha and Prakriti, beautifully uh, shown here. So the solution is found in exactly this particular reconciliation between the inner and outer by um, proposing for us to uh, uh, to um, to remove the desire from our uh, faculties of consciousness or indriyas and to act in life, to be active in life with a free consciousness, which is quite difficult to achieve because our karmendriyas are always, when they are activated, hijacking the light. The moment we start moving, be becoming active outwardly, we are losing the inner perception. So the whole karma yoga was about disinterested action. And there are three stages of karma yoga, as we know. The first is uh, you have right for the action, but not for the fruit of action. Uh, and that is the first freedom. And the second freedom is that freedom from any modality, the choice of activity that I like to do it this way or that way. So we have to be able to do it in any way. And finally, the third and the final liberation that we can see that we are not the doer, that the prakriti is the doer and that the very gunas are rotating in gunas and creating the whole movement outside, which Purusha can perceive and can participate in it as a sakshi and then finally anumanta and uh, the final stage is Ishvara when he becomes totally involved in prakriti. So I stop here. I said many things, and I would like to be better to discuss these things rather than to um, to give the lecture or something kind of. I hope it was um, okay, or oh, too much, or too fast. I don't know. How. <laughs> no, I think the basic message came across quite clearly, so clear that there are actually no questions right now, which is a bit. Uh, right. I'm, I'm sure there must be questions because especially how to how to actually act when you don't have uh, desires. That's not a simple question. Yeah. It's a simple question, but not that simple to answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Practice. By the way, uh, Sri Krishna proposes interesting solution uh, for this. Yeah, he says. Um, I also was thinking, how would you, how would you act if you, if you, no, of course, aspiration. Aspiration is the another motivation which is coming from the inner self. But if you don't have inner self, what should you do when you don't have that contact immediately? You have only the desires. There are two things which are interesting to mention and important to mention. First, uh, Sri Krishna uh, elsewhere in the Gita mentions that not the desire is the problem so much, but desiring the desire. Kama kamin. We are so addicted to the desire in our life that we start to desire the desires. We are looking for the desire as the source and motivation for the action. It is first kind of slavery, yes? We are already wanting that we even we when we don't have the desires we are looking for them and second thing is um, uh, if we are not motivated at all there is no motivation there is no desire in us normal desire is if you are hungry you are hungry you eat if you need to go somewhere you go that is like animals it's it's a normal dharmic karma as he says yeah, I am karma, which is not against dharma. So dharmic karma is not really our problem or our obstacle. Our obstacle is this exaggeration, which we create with our minds, our ego sense. Yeah? And he proposes for us to, to do the action and activities 
dedicated to him. Whatever we do, yes, man ma, as there is a hole in the ninth chapter, the last shloka. Man mana bhava, mad bhakto, mad yaji, mam namaskuru. So fix on me your mind. Become my beloved. Uh, sacrifice only to me and bow or surrender only to me, to me as the supreme, as the universal self within us. Once that is done, it creates a proper motivation which is different from desire. So it kind of burns out the desire. And the desire is no more a problem, as it were. If it, we could sustain that surrender and that invocation and that uh, aspiration towards the highest in us. And that is basically the sacrificial action. And that's how he says in the chapter four that all the action which is done for the sake of the sacrifice is not binding us to the karmic consequences. And what is that sacrificial action? It is the action which is done for the sake of transformation of our nature by a higher consciousness within us. And uh, that's quite a good proposition, I think, which could help. At least to, for me, it sounds very, very plausible and doable. There are several people who ask uh, what actually the difference is between desire and uh, aspiration. Yeah, I, I would, I would uh, like to ask you this question. <laughs> <laughs> That's not <laughs> fair. <laughs> but it would be lovely if you could. Yeah, yes, we have, it would be lovely if you could uh, give this. Uh, yeah, there is a fundamental difference. I can say from my side, and then I would love you to to give also some idea what is the difference. The difference, what I understand, is that the desire is always vital, of vital force of some kind. It is always urgent. Yeah. And it is always um, uh, kind of, uh, you have to do it now. Yeah? Unless you do it now, that would be lost or something. So you, are, you feel this urgency. Aspiration is not like this. Aspiration doesn't have urgency. It is very peaceful. And it, it is in itself um, a, a very pleasant state which can uh, which can last long and forever and every time i am arriving at this aspiration within myself it is it is like uh, it's like you have nothing to achieve but aspiration itself is an achievement yeah? <laughs> there, sure. is, there is yeah. no object object to get so to say whereas desire wants to get something and of course, desire. Yeah, for me, that, that last. Uh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. For me, that if that's the core of the difference. No, desire is uh, an, uh, an attempt to get something for you. So intrinsically, almost it uh, increases your ego. While in aspiration, there is a giving. It is a surrender to something higher, and uh, so it opens up. Desire is intrinsically making smaller. At least in the way. Uh, Shobinu uses it. I, I understand that different people use the words differently, but uh, desire tends to make you, yeah, it is a, an attempt at grabbing something for yourself, while in an aspiration there's an attempt to become something more. So yeah. it is a giving process. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like the same prayer. difference between ambition and aspiration. Right. right. Like prayer, when, when you are in a proper state of prayer, it's already the answer. Something like this. As Mother says, so what if you will have uh, to come again and again and these obstacles come again and again and you are not uh, kind of, uh, you will have your aspiration. You will have that aspiration still with you, <laughs> that sweet aspiration, <laughs> which can be forever. You can stay with it forever because it is so beautiful to be in that state of aspiration. 
And with Somebody desires, wrote that, uh, very different, yeah. Someone wrote that uh, aspiration, uh, if, I'm not 100% sure I understand, but is uh, I will try to achieve this. But that is a sentence that again can uh, very easily change to ambition. No? I want to achieve this. And aspiration is not that. It, it, it gives you over to something higher. Yeah. And it has already a contact yeah. because the one who aspires already already is supported. Uh, the one who loves is already loved. Yeah? The one who chose the divine is already chosen. You could feel that uh, in aspiration. There is that quality. It's not a lack. It's rather a, a kind of a longing for the truth or the divine. It's, uh, it's very yeah. different from, uh, from desire, of course, desire is down to. And desire, as we know, cannot be satisfied. It's uh, totally impossible to satisfy the desire. Shibindu somewhere explains beautifully that every, why we are dissatisfied when we uh, realize our desires. Yeah? We are always have this sense of dissatisfaction. Because truly speaking, we thought that it would be something else, <laughs> that there would be truth in it. <laughs> and, and such a bitter disappointment at the end that there was no real achievement in it. Like, uh, yeah. So we were. Yeah, actually... and uh, someone also mentions that uh, if you lose desire because you are defeated, that is a very different state. That is a kind of giving up, it's a negative thing. Well, in this case, the desire goes because there's something better. Mm -hmm. You kind of leave it behind as, because there's something more beautiful. On desire, yeah. Are, what other questions are there? Yeah. Yeah. On desire, there are so many things in the Indian literature, beautiful uh, stories, and uh, you know the. For example, Dhammapada, the Buddha says that even the rain of golden coins cannot satisfy the desire it's not possible to be satisfied or you know the whole story of uh, of uh, uh, pandavas coming to the lake you remember the lake in mahabharata now mahabharata is becoming popular so the the spirit of the lake asks the puzzle the question to to yudhishthira and if he is answering right he, the lake will let them go or if not they will be enslaved by the lake and um the question was um, what is that losing which you lose nothing and he answered right it was the desire the desire is that losing which you lose nothing. It's quite an interesting uh, perspective. You know? It is something which is <laughs> which is not helpful, <laughs> which is not doing much. Of course, it is helpful to a certain extent to to develop certain ambitions and to develop certain uh, maybe. Um, um, you know, the instruments of knowledge or ignorance rather. Uh, and um, of course, to develop the, the whole machinery of, of nature. But um, uh, truly speaking, uh, it is absolutely not fulfilling anything. It is absolutely unnecessary uh, because there is another motivator behind. And once the desire is gone, that motivator can come forward and occupy our, our front. So the psychic being can shine through and come to the front. But if desire is there in between, it can blocks the way. I, I'm not fully agreeing with you that desire doesn't serve a purpose. I think it depends on the stage of your development. Uh, initially, you need desire to overcome your tamas, laziness. And uh, someone asked whether it means that you should replace bad desires by good desires. And I think that is a stage where that is really needed. And in that period, you need your desires in, in order to, uh, to get somewhere. Like there is a stage in life where ambition helps. But indeed, in the next stage, it is something that stands in between because it increases your ego. So you have to kind of let it go. So I think there are there are stages in life where these things work somewhat differently. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you totally. I was talking from the highest so, yeah. point of view of the yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, at a higher level, certainly it's dense in a way. But in the beginning, I think desire is really needed. And if you give it up too early, then life just uh, degenerates. Uh, you yeah. end up in inaction, and uh, that's worse than... Uh, I agree, I agree, I agree. And I think the Gita also uh, says that. Yeah. Yeah. I have also a question to you, Vladimir. I, I want to ask you something. If you just have an aspiration for the divine, what happens if you find only the silence and it doesn't fill in itself with anything? Yeah? The divine clearly has created the world, so the divine itself is active. Otherwise, this whole beautiful world would not have existed. But if in your aspiration, in your wish to let go of desires, you end up in a in a beautiful empty space, something like what the Buddhists uh, have as their ideal. How do you move from there? How do you know that what comes is not again coming from below instead of from above? How do you really distinguish the inner commands that come from above from the inner commands that still come from below? Or are you just slowly tweaking your inner, your lower desires into better ones till they become more and more divine due to an increasing psychic or, or, or spiritual presence? Or do you have actually two entirely different styles of motivation, the one that comes from above and the one that comes from below? And within, yes. And uh, there are different uh, different powers which are coming from within the heart and from above the yeah. head, and uh, they are yeah. of quite different nature. Yeah, and they are not yeah. the same. And you have good and bad influences. The world is pretty complicated inside. Yeah. So how do you distinguish? Well, we learn to distinguish on by mistakes <laughs> and by yeah, we, and we, blundering along. Right. It is not. So simple to distinguish them, but somehow we have some kind of sense of it. Uh, I could say that the difference between it's like difference between the desire and the aspiration. You know? Aspiration is making you free. It does not demand from you anything. It just takes you totally, and you are you are in that sweetness wave. You are ready to be in it, and uh, and it doesn't demand anything from you or from anyone. It is not imposing itself. It is not uh, uh, calling anyone to join you or anything. There is not, none of the kind. There is no missionary you know, work to be done or religious kind of zeal to be. Uh, it is very different. The moment it starts to be that religious zeal or something, you have to know that that's already vital joining. It wants to, sure. to have its yeah. share. Yes, in it. Uh, um, so uh, it's, it's. I do not know how to. Uh, it's by experience. <clears throat> these things you slowly are tuning yourself and purifying some parts of yourself to to recognize them as different movements of consciousness within you. Yes, there is. They are all belong. I can understand that you cannot define it because the moment you could give a hard definition, it could be, uh, it's good, you could cheat also. So obviously, it has to be an inner perception that is uh, very, very clear. But that uh, emptiness about which you say, it's very important because that is the purity in which actually things can come in a true manner, true way. Yeah? You can see truth through that, uh, through that transparency of being. If it is too much clogged with many different movements, it's very difficult to see the truth and to allow the deeper yeah. truth to emerge. So it's a very yeah. important stage. Yeah. yeah, we definitely need that emptiness mm -hmm. and this is. And I would say also the presence. No? One of the wonderful things of the Gita is the presence of Krishna in this story, mm. which makes it so different from uh, the Iliad, which was the old, a, a very comparable scripture from the Greek tradition, where there is no Krishna in this story. 
that uh, that's such a big difference. Right. So we have so many people, 165. Is that kind of interesting? That's the same number as yesterday. Um, no. What other questions are there? I'm the awareness of what's good and bad, it is somewhat similar. How, to, how do we redirect this tendency for desire? How do you get rid of the desires? Hmm. <laughs> how do we get rid of the desires? By trying to fulfill them and see that they are never fulfilled. Yeah? And then getting tired of fulfilling them finally, understanding that they can't be fulfilled. Even the rain of golden coins, says the Hamapada, cannot satisfy the desire. <laughs> Even the rain of golden coins. <laughs> it's quite quite a comparison. Yeah? <laughs> the desire is uh, cannot be satisfied. And it's always hungry for more and more. Mm. Uh, so better not to satisfy desire altogether. Better to go for the aspiration. And then there is no need in satisfaction of aspiration. There is no audio, and something else. Could you please I elaborate? Think no audio. Yeah. I, I should. Audio, be the problem must be on your side because most people have the uh, audio. So, yeah. But I have, guess I have to write it because the person will not hear it. How can we apply these concepts to psychotherapy and counseling? I, I think it's a question to you, Matthias. Oh, one second. Uh, I think there, there are probably many more uh, uh, people who do psychotherapy uh, on a daily basis within the audience. Um, that I would, for me, there are two answers. One is that in psycho, okay, one important one is that in psychotherapy, a very big role is played by a kind of contagion of consciousness. Uh, a lot of the, the therapy takes place, I think, because you show the client that you have really understood the problem. You're not denying it or pushing it aside or anything. And yet, you know, there is a solution which the client can find. And you kind of help the client to develop that self-confidence to find that solution. Another way where it comes in, I think, is that uh, is that presence of Krishna. Um, and it doesn't need to be Krishna. It just it means the presence of whatever is for you the divine. I think therapy is uh, basically too difficult for the uh, for the logical mind to solve because people are too complicated. So it occurs very often that there is no logical reason to take the therapy one direction or another. And my experience is that very often you can hear a kind of voice, you can get an, in, an inner intuition that you should take the discussion in one way or in another way, that it is good to say one thing or another thing. And that intuition tends to work. And you can slowly learn what the inner guidance is that works and which is the inner guidance that does not work. And the better you get at that, the more often you will say what is right. And one of the nice things about doing uh, therapy is that it is too difficult and so the only way to do it well is by using intuition and uh, when you try to be intuitive while you do therapy you automatically do your sadhana and you clean up internally and so the more you do it the better you get at it and the cleaner you become yourself so the, the better life becomes in general so I would say that the, the core of it is that presence of Krishna, which I think is also the, really the core of the Gita. You know, that basic moment where Arjuna has to choose between the army and the presence of, Gita, of uh, Krishna personally and chooses for Krishna. 
first for me that is really the the very essence of the book and all the rest is subsequent to that one decisive moment and in therapy also you have the, the army is all these technical methods you have all these you can say the tricks of the trade but the thing that really makes the difference is the presence of that inner guide mm -hmm. and uh, i don't know that is what mm. my answer would be about what the gita has to contribute to uh, therapy i don't think it is any specific there are many specific issues but the core is really that inner presence i would say Now, Amir, does that make sense to you, or totally, totally. any people in the audience who feels like that? Very beautiful, very beautiful. Of course, you have the audience from from the psychology point. Of view. They say these are psychologists, and you have to speak their language, psychological language. Here, there is one more question: How it was? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, can you elaborate how to control desires? This is something which I could also readdress to you, uh, because Sri Krishna in the Gita says, kill the enemy, <laughs> that's it. <clears throat> because uh, karma is the enemy, the, the desire. So desiring the desires is the enemy, truly speaking. The desire itself is still the, 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 uh, the, the means of nature to get where you have to get, you know, to go. But when you start desiring the desires, that is something which leads you to some kind of perversion. You know? And that's where, for example, these uh, animals, they don't have this desiring the desires. They may be learned from human beings being with them, uh, some dogs and cats. But uh, truly speaking, um, uh, only human beings have that. So, um, how to control it? Uh, Sri Krishna says, kill the enemy. Jahi Shatram Mahabhava. <laughs> kill the enemy. <laughs> so, but it is uh, the suggestion for Kshatriya. You know? Kshatriya who is ready to do it. Uh, what, what about others who are not so powerful to, to destroy the desire? It's a big question how to handle it. You know? I think we have to find the true aspiration in ourselves. And that could substitute the desire. It is much sweeter and much more um, attractive uh, for, for our nature. And so if we substitute it with that aspiration for the highest good in everyone and ourselves, that could be the way out. And we have to train ourselves, definitely. It doesn't come immediately. Desire still still creeps in, and there are many projections in the world <clears throat> which are generating and creating desires constantly, yes, advertisement and so on and so forth. You can see them from everywhere there, looking at you and trying to catch you. <laughs> I think in that latter part, uh, you you got something that's very helpful even desires that seem to come from inside i think it is very helpful to look at them as if they come from outside and in a way they come from outside because they definitely don't come from the soul which is what you really are so seeing your desires as not your desires but as desires that come to you makes it easier to let them go and fighting your desires i think is a is kind of a a recipe for desire, desire because if you fight you hold them with one hand and you fight you you beat them with the other hand and they don't go away uh -huh. i think the, the the better technique is to to let them go to just let them drift away uh -huh. like you say vladimir uh, you concentrate on something better yeah. I tried to fight the desires. Actually, it was a total disaster in my life. It <laughs> yes, it it. Yeah. It, I was yeah. making you make them, them stronger. stronger. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can let them go. I know one psychologist who said uh, there is one technique that uh, psychotherapists always, uh, nobody uh, recommends, but that actually works best, and that's a distraction. Mm. Just do something else. And it, it goes. 
Yeah. But it comes, and it the, waits, it <laughs> waits behind the corner. And when you... <laughs> no, but if, it, it, if you do it systematically and don't give it a chance, then uh, it, it just gets less, I think. It, it gets tired and then forgets about it. And then, but really fighting with it definitely doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there are many techniques to fight with the desire. I can be, uh, and Sri Aurobindo also speaks about it. That um, um, one of uh, of this is to to even to even when the desire is too strong and not going anywhere, it's just waiting behind the corner. You know, you feel oh, okay, you got rid of it, and it is a hoop. It's already there. Or it is all the time nagging, nagging, nagging and exhausting you and exhausting. You go away from it and it is still there holding you somewhere. And then um, he says that there are even techniques to allow it a little bit boga, as he says, a little bit boga. But in the moment you give it boga, so to say, you feed it with, uh, with what it wants. Uh, you have to be in control. You should not fall into it, yeah, into its lap. So to say, you you do it as as is just to weaken it a little bit and then throw it away. But what happens usually? We fall into the lap totally, <laughs> and then it comes back totally in a total blast. It's a, it's a it's a struggle. Yeah, it's a big yogic struggle. The desire is the biggest problem, definitely. It's a, not a small thing, and there are many desires, and uh, not only some, but there are all kind of varieties of desires. You know, who uh, want to be realized through us. <clears throat> Later, we will see that they are not actually our forces, not our energies. They are coming from the universal vital, usually from lower or middle vital, and try to get possession over us. Once we see that, it is easier to get rid of them. Once you identify yourself with consciousness which is higher, purusha, so to say, which is observing everything, the flow of desires, thoughts, uh, of nature, then it is easier to step back and observe them and to be not attaching ourselves to them. That is the technology, yes, to stepping back always, stepping back and observing. Let them flow, but don't catch them, don't go with them, don't meet them, don't fight with them. The more you fight with the desire, the, the weaker you become. You know? Let them flow and see how they pass through okay they are here like like the birds in the windless air they pass somewhere i'm saying something which is more desirable than <laughs> achieved sorry it's much more difficult to achieve than to say about it <laughs> right but i always try to do it and sometimes it happens and it uh, I, if one can succeed for for a while, and then again one is knocked down by something. And Mother says, interesting thing, that it will be coming again and again and again and again in different, little different form until you're totally, how to say, ready. Until you're totally exhausting the topic. And then you can be in control. But it will be visiting and revisiting as if it, you never did any change in your life, if you're fighting with it. Yeah? So stepping back is a good technique, stepping back and observing what is flowing there without participating, without catching it. Let that go. Uh, there are more questions. Me, someone asks uh, to give an example of desiring to desire. Well, we are constantly desiring the desire. First, we fight the desire. We don't want the desire to be there. And then once it is not there, we are calling for it. We really want it to come back. We are kind of missing our best friend. Best friend, because with that friend, I identify myself. I know who I am. 
I am that weak person who is fighting the desire, who has these problems. I know myself as such. So every time I abolish something, drop that desire, I start missing it up to some time. <laughs> I'm not myself anymore. <laughs> I want it back. And then when it is back, oh, now I know I am, I am still myself. <laughs> that is me with these desires fighting. <laughs> so this is something uh, very interesting. We love, as Shibinda says, we love the chains which chain us. We love our golden cage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is, of course, something very general, no? that uh, we basically we love our difficulties because they are part of our identity. So yeah. that goes uh, very far. As far as uh, desiring to desire, I think amongst the questions, there are many examples, like people who say without desire, there would be no competition. And so that would not be very healthy. Or uh, if you don't have desire, then you fall into depression. But uh, the thing is, the desire is useful till it is replaced by something higher. And uh, the moment that higher thing comes in, then this desire uh, becomes kind of, yeah, irrelevant or polluting. So yeah. the what is to, to get that higher thing to come in. Yeah, what is interesting, we are using desire in this particular setting of you know, the Gita, yes, and post credit literature. If we go deeper, we will see that the desire can be treated or viewed differently, as Sri Aurobindo does it in Savitri or in the Veda. In the Veda, desire doesn't have that negative connotation, yes, which we have in uh, the post-Vedic literature. Um, and it has something to do with the shift of uh, structures. So to say we shift it into the mental structure of consciousness from some mythical or some magic structure where the desire was one of the powers which worked, yes. And uh, then later it changed its uh, value or its, um, its nature, as it were. It became mental desire with kind of perversion of some kind. Before it was kind of naturally flowing with things, and now it becomes a kind of exaggeration of some kind and um, in the mental structure of consciousness. And there we have a, um, a problem. Yeah? We speak in, this, in, in the terms of the mental structure of the Gita's language. But if you come down to Shirobindo uses the, the divine desire even uh, in Savitri. So the, it can be a, some kind of, because he even speaks about sublimation of that Agni, yes, which is a smoking and burning in the lower uh, levels of consciousness, gives a lot of smoke, and that is a smoke of desire. And once it is uh, rising higher and higher, it becomes more and more subliminal, sublimated, and purified, and so there is no more desire. That's the aspiration. But on the lower levels, it is really a heavy burden. It's, it is a smoky and... Uh, um, so, but this view, what I'm just now sharing, it is not the view of the, of the post-Vedic literature. It's uh, um, of the Vedic time, yes, of the magic and mythical structure of consciousness, where uh, that treatment was very different. Of karma um, itself. Jochna, um, it is uh, already uh, 12 minutes over the time. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should end the session? Uh, maybe if any last question and then we end? There is I would like to suggest one thing. There are several people who ask for uh, books, guidance, uh, and so on. Um, so it would be a good idea, I think, at uh, either during the this seminar or at the end of it, to hmm. uh, make somewhere an easily accessible website where people can find resources. Sure. And we'll I would say it would be nice also if you give an address where people who have good resources Mm -hmm. uh, can leave that information so that collectively we can uh, answer some of these questions. Like someone so, asks about, uh, is there anything about uh, Steiner and the Gita? I uh -huh. would have no idea, but I'm sure that in the whole group, there must be someone who knows enough about Steiner and the Gita to know whether there's a link between the two. So yeah. 
I don't know if you can organize that in some way. That sure, but uh, now we have got some permission, helpful. so we will uh, like to take it forward. Yeah, that would be very nice to do. It. All right. Okay. I would, uh, of course, I, I very much uh, thank Vladimir for uh, giving all his uh, his aspiration and his presence uh, in this session, which I always uh, very much enjoy. And uh, I also uh, very much would like to thank, like yesterday, the participants, because uh, there's been so much enthusiasm and so many good questions. And I feel a bit embarrassed and bad that so few of the answers could really get a good answer. Um, George, I think it would be very useful if we could uh, uh, really put all the questions in a file and uh, see if we can somehow still group them and answer them, either in writing or in some other way. Sure. Right? Because it is a pity when these answer, these questions just get lost. Yeah. Some will have been answered, of course, but many of them still uh, are kind of hanging. Yeah. We still figuring out the technology uh, part of it. I think it automatically saves in the text file. We'll get back okay. to that because copy um, option is not there. So we'll get back with all the questions. Yeah, try that. And uh, maybe make a, a, some kind of a, what used to be a, a Yahoo group or a, a, a Gmail group where mm. people can uh, help to answer each other. Mm. I think that should help. Something like that could be done. Okay. Thank you both very much. And uh, thank everybody else who was present. And looking forward to the coming days and the remaining sessions. Great. Thank you. So it's nice uh, to you. <laughs> Maybe uh, Vladimir can give me the host option. Um, yeah, we should. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, the, you have to stop the. So sorry. Uh, stop. Uh, what do we have? Stop share. Yes. Yes, and you have to get from me. Meanwhile, um, I really, really like to thank um, the chairperson, Dr. Mathais, and Dr. Vladimir, for uh, this wonderful session. Almost 14 years back, we had a um, session here on Gita in um, Nimans. And I still remember uh, both of you were part of that and some of the things which you spoke and like, um, it was so powerful. And now we are here. I hope uh, some of the participants would have also felt similarly. And um, thank you everyone. And I thank you participants for joining our early morning because I know that it is a clash with your other commitments and all. Uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Namaste. See you, Matthias. Bye. Bye-bye.